Welcome to the first episode of Ask Freeman. This will be a periodic episode type or segment where we just take a bunch of smaller questions that people have submitted to the show and just answer them in a few minutes. A lot of times we'll take, you know, questions that people ask and we'll make full length episodes out of them, but we want to start some of these kind of more shorter form answers to some shorter questions. So if you have questions, you can always email them to us at questions at retirementorship.com or you can go to retirementorship.com slash question and there's just a short form in there. You don't even need to put your email address in there if you don't want to. And uh, and then we'll you can just ask a question. We'll to try to get it on one of these Ask Freeman episodes. So without further ado, let's just jump into a couple questions here. Uh, the first one here is from Robert and he asks, do you track net worth in YNAB? So it- if you're very new to the show, obviously we 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 talked about uh, the power of cash flow and net worth. It was a few episodes ago, um, and, and making a net worth and cash flow statement. And then we did some episodes on budgeting and the app You Need a Budget, which I highly recommend. And you can get uh, if you're a client of ours, and, and potentially even if you're a retired member as well. So go back and listen to those if you haven't. So it's a good question, Robert. Like, do you implement those things together? Then do you take the the net worth side of, of the power of having net worth and knowing what that is and tracking that. And do you incorporate that with YNAB and that app and always having that at your fingertips? Um, I do, but with some caveats there. So YNAB has this feature where it'll have like what they call your budgeting accounts, right? And that's where it takes in your checking, uh, your savings, maybe if you use it for that, uh, and then any credit cards or charge cards, those kind of things, right? And and it uses all of those and comes up with like your total like budget amount, like how much money do you actually have, which is basically, your, you know, your, your amount in your bank accounts minus any amount that you have outstanding in credit cards. And so if you've got, you know, $15,000 in your checking, but you got $6,000 in outstanding credit card balances of just stuff that you're running up, even if you're paying them off, then you don't really have $15,000, right? You really have nine, 15,000 minus 6,000. And so it does a great job of doing those kind of budget accounts. And then also has this tracking feature where you can connect other accounts and just track them. And so maybe they, they're not part of your budget, right? You're not using them for, for daily expenses, but you just want to kind of pay attention to those and, and, and see uh, what's going on there. And then it will actually have a net worth uh, report uh, in the desktop version of uh, YNAB. It's one of the few things that are only in the desktop and not in the mobile. And so the question is, do you, you know, do I do this? Do I track net worth in YNAB? So yes, I do. Um, and so like, I'll, I'll do the, you know, my house and I'll update that once a year, put that in there. Um, I'll update, you know, some other different accounts and stuff. One caveat though, is that I don't connect investment accounts. You can technically, because it uses plaid connections. You can connect, you know, your Roth IRAs and your 401. Like you could do all that if you want, but I don't recommend doing that. And the reason is I don't recommend that you look at balances in investment accounts more than once a year, if possible, right? Like if you, if you are planting an oak tree, you don't go dig it up every day to see how it's growing or even every week or even every month or even every quarter. And so I don't, I don't even recommend looking at monthly statements or quarterly statements, let alone uh, daily seeing what the balance of those accounts are. We are investing for the long term, right? Even if you are right up against retirement and, and so the value of those accounts seem to really matter because you're just about to retire or, or whatever else, you, you still have you know, decades to go in retirement, right? We always say that retirement is not the finish line. It's, it's mile marker 13.2 in a marathon. You're only halfway there. Um, and, and so just in general, I don't recommend seeing the balances of your investment accounts. They'll go up and down. They'll drive you crazy because one day they're up with another day they're down and they're way down. And oh, oh my gosh, I lost $15,000 or I made $10,000 or whatever else. And, and so to see that just creates a general anxiety around investments. And so if you're going to use the net worth tracking portion, just like the tracking accounts portion of YNAB, that I don't recommend you actually connect your investment accounts. So what I do is once a year, at the end of the year, I take the, the annual amounts, the year-end amounts of any investment accounts. I, we do an analysis of what, what my businesses are worth, and we put those in there. And, and so I'll update those you know, annually just to see, hey, kind of where are we at? each. In the same way, I do a, a network statement once a year and to see, hey, what, where was everything at the end of the, the year? I can also just update those values manually in YNAB. And so I personally do, I do like having that in there and having it at the palm of my hand so I can always know kind of what my net worth is at. Um, and, you know, you see, you know, we've got mortgages and stuff and those, those get tracked in there as well, of course. And so you can see the mortgage is getting paid down and the assets growing in general and see that trend and all those other awesome, you know, powerful things about knowing your net worth and, and paying attention to that. 
that. And so YNAB does become a great place to do that as well, but don't connect your investment accounts. It's too much information. You really just want to be focusing on your day-to-day. Hey, what can we do every day to move the needle, to push our our budget forward to to do these things? Um, So yeah, that's how I do it, Robert. I hope that's helpful for you. Hope you're enjoying YNAB and uh, and that you're making some good use out of it. Um, But the important thing is to create those habits, if you're new to it, create those habits of actually budgeting and tracking your expenses and and making your money do what you want it to do instead of wondering where it went. Like establishing those habits over time are the most important. Don't spend too much time, especially at the beginning, getting bogged down, like trying to track every detail, Uh, get the habits going first before we kind of do some of those more advanced uh, steps. Uh, Tiffany asks, uh, my husband works too much. Uh, how do I get him to stop working so much and to slow down? I, I don't, I'm not sure this is the right, um, place for this question. That seems more like, a maybe for a marriage podcast or something like that. I will say, um, a couple of things. One, um, some people, there's a pressure to work and to make money when there's a, there is a lot of money going out. So when, there, there, when it seems like you can't make progress and, and the money is just being spent constantly, there's a pressure to always be trying to make that money. And because some people, some people have a different threshold between how much money they are comfortable with having in their accounts or, or in control of all the time. So if it's leaving very quickly, they want to be filling it in even more quickly. Or even, even if there's just the perception of that, right? And so one thing that I've noticed is that, you know, there's some of us have like this proclivity to always be thinking of ways to spend money. We're always thinking of the next trip we want to take, the next item we want to buy, the next whatever else. And, and if, so I guess, you know, we can't control other people, right? Tiffany? So I, I don't know how to, how, how much influence you can have on making him stop working so much or, or making him slow down. Um, all we can control is ourselves. Um, so I might, uh, for whatever this is worth and the advice is worth what you pay for it, right? Um, I might think about, am I always talking about how to spend money and am I always driving the focus on on how to get rid of the money, which is making him subconsciously want to always be making it to replace that, right? And so it, maybe there's just some things that you can do to to divert that. And maybe if, if, if there's more ways of the, of your thinking of how do, we, how do we save more money? How do we do these things? A good resource for that, honestly, is to look at some of the work of like the, the simplicity movement or the, the minimalism movement. You can, uh, you know, get the book, the more of less by J- Joshua Becker or watch the, the minimalism documentary on uh, Netflix or some of these other things. And then if you, there's a whole movement over there, which is all about, Hey, life isn't about spending money, right? It's not about gaining more and more things and you're constantly buying more and more and then you got to get bigger houses to store more and more of your junk and and then storage units and you got money going everywhere just to to own all these things. And life is more about experiences and relationships and some of these other things. So <clears throat> I want to do a podcast on that at some point um, because I think it's, it's powerful and something that I'm trying to, I'm, I want to get better at myself before I talk about it more. But that might be something for you to consider is like, hey, is there things that I can do to to begin minimizing the amount of money that I'm trying to spend or that we are encouraging our household to spend and how do we save more? And as, as some of that accumulates then inside of your accounts instead of grow and there isn't this constant focus on how do we spend money, then maybe you'll have less of a focus on how to make money. So that's just, again, this is probably not even the place to be asking that question, but forever that's worth from the financial uh, angle of it. Um, maybe that would be helpful to you. The other thing that, that you might do is, um, you know, we talked about, in a few episodes ago, having goals together and and having a, a focus, I think it was in the budgeting episode of, you know, do you guys have joint goals? Do you have things that you're trying to do and are your goals aligned? Have you had those conversations about, hey, what do we want our money to do for us? What are our goals as a family, as a household, as a couple? Um, and if you haven't had those goals, like maybe you guys are, are, are really aiming in the different directions you don't know and that's causing that friction between there. And so that'd be something to look at is having those goals. And then lastly, I guess the only other thing as I'm thinking about this, is we've had some people who are aggressive, like are truly aggressive savers. And so maybe you're not spending anything. I may have was totally out based on that. And you're like, no, he just works a lot. We just, we keep making more and more money. We've got more money than we know what to do with, but they just keep making it. And, and some people, again, there's this, there's also the issue that we don't, we still don't have enough, right? And we see that a lot. And sometimes then doing a financial plan and, and we talked about this actually in the benefits of financial planning last week, but one of the benefits being visualization and actually being able to see the effects of everything that you're doing and have yet to do. And so we've had several clients that have come to us and it hasn't been about like, hey, 
how do we save a little bit more or, or make your money work harder for you, pay less. And I mean, it is about those things too, but, but it's been less about how do we get you to save more to make sure we hit your goals. And it actually has been, Hey, you guys have saved way too much. You're going to have more money than you know what to do with. So how do we start spending more or how do we start earning less? Or can you, can you ditch that job that you actually hate because you don't actually need the money anymore? Or you know, some of these other more freedom, more life giving uh, elements of, of finances. And so that's one of the kind of the hidden, um, out, outcomes of financial planning, I think, that don't often get thought about is that there are some people that save too much and they make too much and just out of this compulsion, they don't think they have enough. And when you can show them, hey, we actually do have enough, you have enough to do everything you want to do and more, you know, can you slow down? Can you try to do other things? Uh, so that might be the other element. So there's maybe the spending side, like we're spending too much and they're always trying to make money to do it, or you're saving too much and we don't realize we already have enough and kind of using some some goal setting or some of these, um, you know, financial planning, that kind of things might help settle one uh, or the other of those. So for whatever that's worth, um, I hope that's helpful for that. So one more here. Uh, uh, Tim asked, do you recommend the debt snowball or the debt avalanche for paying down debt? Um, so, okay. So if you don't know what this is, debt snowball is basically you, if you got a whole bunch of debts, you arrange them all from the smallest balance to the largest balance. You don't think about interest rate. You don't think about the type of loan. It doesn't matter. Like smallest to, to, to largest. And you pay off the smallest one first. You make minimum payments on all of them. You pay off the smallest one first. And when that's done, then you turn that payment around and you start paying off the next smallest one. And that, when that one's paid off, you take those first two payments and you roll it into paying off the third one, et cetera. And it, so it becomes like this snowball, right? And as it rolls downhill, it picks up snow, it picks up additional minimum payments. And so by the time you get to the bigger ones at the end, now you've got a big chunk of cash flow attacking those debts uh, every month to start paying those down. And so that that's the debt snowball concept. Dave Ramsey's famous for teaching this, right? Uh, other people uh, advocate for it as well. And then there's the debt avalanche, which I think someone just tried to take the snowball analogy and try to make it sound cooler by calling it an avalanche instead of a snowball, which is basically you do it by interest rate, right? Like, hey, your highest interest rate ones are the ones that are causing the most damage. Uh, you know, they're racking up tons and tons of interest. We got to kill those first. And then so you, you organize your debts by order of highest interest rate to lowest interest rate and you pay off the highest interest rate ones first and then work your way down because mathematically you will actually pay off your debt faster doing it that way because you're killing off the high interest debt. Um, the debt snowball advocates would say you're, you're, you know, if, if you were all about the math in the first place, you wouldn't have gotten this much debt. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter what the math says, because if you were good at math, right, no offense, but if we were good at math, we wouldn't have gotten to this much debt in the first place because we would have seen how crippling, uh, interest and in, in debt is. And so, you know, they advocate for more the behavioral aspect of you gain steam, you gain momentum, by paying off these debts and seeing them go away and seeing the progress. And that keeps you excited and keeps you motivated to keep uh, paying down the debt. Um, if I had to choose, I would choose the debt snowball for sure. Uh, for that reason, right? That, that if we have a lot of debts, then we probably weren't paying attention to the math in the first place. Otherwise, why would we have it? Um, I think there's some, you know, there can be some small tweaks in there. I'm certainly a, a, a fan of listing them all out and having an exact order that you're going to pay them off, Right. And in general, I like the smallest balance to largest balance first. Now, you might flip a couple of them, right? Let's say that you've got two debts, one of them's a thousand and one of them's fifteen hundred, right? So the thousand one is smaller, and so normally you pay that one off, and then the fifteen hundred dollar one. But maybe the fifteen hundred dollar one is is you know a credit card that's got twenty five percent interest on it, and the thousand dollar one is you know uh, the last bit of a car loan or something that's at three percent, right? Well, you can flip those if you want. And or, or whatever it is, right? If, if the balances are technically one smaller and should be paid off, but it's but the the slightly larger one has a much higher interest rate, you can flip those if you want, uh, just to kind of get the best of both worlds there. But in general, the smaller smallest balance, the largest balance, I think is better for all the behavioral reasons why we did it. Right? It's not about what we know. If it's just about knowing what's better in the math and all that, then we'd all be billionaires with six pack abs. Right? There's more to life and more to personal finance than just what the math says we should or shouldn't do. Um, and so we need to, we need to account for those behavioral elements as well and, and the momentum and the, the motivation to actually carry through a plan. Cause no, the, the best debt plan is the one that actually gets fully implemented and you actually pay off all the debt. That's the best debt payoff plan, right? Um, and so people just seems like in general, more people have been successful paying off their debt with the debt snowball than the so-called debt avalanche. So hopefully, um, you just 
that's what I recommend. That's what I recommend. Dead Snowball. So, okay. Hopefully those have been helpful. You will be back with more Ask Ruben. We're going into our, our kind of busy time in my financial plan firm of spring reviews, tax returns. You know, we're all integrated and doing all that stuff all at once. So I might actually just do a few of these uh, Ask Freeman episodes in a row here just because they're easier for me to produce than to, to actually write out content. And I'm still trying to do some of the other stuff that we're doing. Um, you know, as far as like the weekly emails and some of those other things, if you're a retired member, we're still going to be producing that. So I might do shorter, easier for me uh, podcast episodes over the next few weeks while we go through spring reviews and tax season. Um, so stay tuned. Hope you, if you know, if you haven't ever yet, you listen on Apple uh, podcasts or one of the other ones that I'll you to rate. And this has been a helpful podcast to you. I'd love it if you'd give it a five stars. It helps other people find the podcast and, and spread it. And of course, um, we've got lots more in store uh, coming up. Hope this has been helpful. We'll see you next week. Cheers. If you enjoyed that, you would love being part of our free membership community. It's called Retire Membership. And there's a host of benefits all for free. For example, you can always buy my book, 3D Retirement Income, on Amazon. But if you join us at Retire Membership, we will send you either a hard copy or paperback for free, provide the ebook and the audiobook so that you can listen to it if you don't have time to read it. In addition to that, we'll also provide you with a bunch of content that you can't get anywhere else. For example, we have our quarterly Retire Mentorship magazine which comes out quarterly and has no ads whatsoever. It's just timely content to help you stay the course. We also have workbooks for our free online workshop to help you get the most out of those, flowcharts to help you make better decisions, and a weekly email to provide timely content that you can unsubscribe from at any time. We never ask for any payment information and we never share your information with anyone else. We just want to provide timely content and help you stay the course to retire successfully and stay successfully retired. There's no reason to wait. So join us now at retiremembership.com where you can click in the link in the description and it'll go right there. We can't wait to see you in the community. Cheers. This podcast is educational only and is not investment, tax, or legal advice.